Welcome, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining today's discussion on rural connectivity. So much of what we see here on the show floor in Barcelona is really highlighting the advent of a next generation of technologies. But we also know that a lot of our fellow citizens are still living without any of the benefits of mobile broadband. The COVID-19 pandemic has highlighted really like never before the importance of connectivity. For the past 16 months, connectivity has shaped the way we live, work, and socialize. But it has also highlighted the gaps. How do we respond to this challenge to build a more inclusive world? And that's what this session will focus on, how to ensure that those living in rural areas are able to participate in the digital economy, in the digital, uh, digital society, and are not left behind. We know that today, 51% of the world's population is connected to mobile broadband, but that means almost half of the world is not and is digitally excluded. And there's two main categories we want to examine today. First, the coverage gap those living in rural areas that are not covered by mobile broadband networks. And this represents about 8% of the population, or 500 million people. Second, the usage gap. Those in rural areas who have access to broadband networks, but for a range of reasons, are not using them. And this is a much larger number, 41% of the population, or 3.3 billion people. Now, we're fortunate today to be joined by a great panel of experts to give their insights and their perspectives on these issues. We have with us in person Nicholas Zibel, Chief Business Officer for KIOS Technologies, and Mohammed Samuel Islam, owner of ZTech. I invite you forward. Joining us virtually, we have Mark Alara, CEO of BT Consumer Brands, Jami Hindman, CTO for John Deere, and Bernard Bourget, co-founder for Vertical Bridge. So let's dive into today's panel. Welcome to you both here, and thank you so much for joining us virtually as well. Thanks. Um, so I really, there's so much we can cover. We could go on for, for days on this topic. So let's, let's dive right in. Um, and I would ask just that we make the most of the session, if we can try to keep our responses to within three or four minutes each. So, and the first question, just to give a little advance notice, I want to direct to Samuel here, as well as Mark and Bernard. And it is to touch this first issue, the coverage gap. So the reality is that uncovered communities are predominantly in rural areas where deploying infrastructure can be twice as expensive, with revenues up to 10 times lower than in urban areas. So Samuel, let me start with you, since you're sitting here right next to me, and then we'll move on virtually. How can we address this challenge and expand coverage of broadband networks to rural communities, and importantly, in a way that's commercially sustainable? Uh, thank you very much, John. Uh, and greetings from Bangladesh. Uh, uh, there is no one way we can ad actually address this issue. So what we are doing in uh, ZTech, uh, that we are offering low-cost internet to rural areas of Bangladesh, and uh, we are tackling these issues in three separate ways. One is a network, uh, lowering the network cost, three is our revenue model, and one is our community services. Uh, if we talk about like the networking uh, uh, topology that we are doing, uh, in, uh, we are inspired by GSM technology and we are using like uh, wired and Wi-Fi technology in a hybrid way so that we can, we can cover most a large area and lowering our cost. We go up to a point with wires, like a public place or uh, community places, and then we set up our Wi-Fi devices, and that brings our uh, networking cost lower and uh, connects more people. That is a networking issue, and uh, second of all, we are uh, using our revenue model in, three, in, in two ways. Is, uh, one is sub monthly subscription fees, and another is a pay-as-you-go model where we are offering as low as 10 cents or less uh, per day usage, uh, unlimited uh, usage for uh, broadband. And uh, it, it, is, it is getting popular day by day. And uh, the third of all, the community services that we are providing, that is also a very big part. Uh, we have created uh, community spaces where people can come and uh, use our facilities at a very low cost. And for uh, women entrepreneurs, we are, we are offering subsidized rates 
uh, that is that is helping our women community as well and um, and uh, we are all doing it with our uh, with the help of our government otherwise it is it was not possible they are giving us the backbones and they are giving us the subsidies everything so yeah this is how it is uh, we are doing for uh, quite some time now and it, it is working so far thank you Thank you very much. Very uh, great points you, you, you highlighted in there, especially the sort of shared incentives and also, of course, the challenge of tackling the gender gap. Gender gap. Now, maybe I can jump uh, virtually um, to Mark. Um, would love to get your thoughts on this same point of how do we have a commercially sustainable approach to reaching these rural communities where the cost of deployment are higher? Yeah, thanks. And, and uh, you know, you've highlighted the challenges very clearly in terms of the the, the economics of, of cost and, and revenue. We're, we're the UK's biggest operator. Uh, we have the biggest network. We've got more coverage than any any other operator in the UK, but we still recognise there's, there's work to do. Uh, in the last year alone, we upgraded 300 sites and we built more than 160 sites, but there are still parts of the UK that are, are not yet connected. And I think the the answer to the question is is um you know in in the sense more optimistic i'm much more optimistic now about the the opportunities and the capabilities we have in the in the future because i think the the focus before was on one single solution of just more masts and the thing that's happening now with the evolution of technology means we've got a lot more opportunities and capabilities coming to provide solutions to customers now whether that's space technologies and we've recently signed a an mou with OneWeb, looking at how satellite can help uh looking at small cells looking at drones uh you know we've been looking at all kinds of new technologies as well as rapid response vehicles which we previously just used for emergency response uh situations but also looking at how they can provide um capability and coverage as well so i, th I think the positive news is there's a lot more capability and technologies and options to give customers more coverage uh, that we're experimenting with um, and some really good progress being made. Um, but it is still a, a, you know, a, a challenging area with, with uh, the economic um, profile of rural coverage still being a challenging one. And that's where we need to work very closely with government and, and regulators, uh, as well as commercial organizations to find the right uh, solutions for customers in those, in, in those areas. Thank you so much. And you know, now, Bernard, I mean, I uh, excellent uh, discussion there about the way technology is actually giving us more choices now. Obviously, still challenges. Bernard, I'd love your perspectives on some of the points raised so far, and as well as your own perspectives. Sure. Good morning. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Um, so I'm going to start off by saying that uh, in order to really um, address the uh, rural broadband coverage uh, concerns, it has to be a private public uh, partnership. And um, the first point that I like to make about this is as long as American operators and majority of European operators have to pay uh, hundreds of millions of dollars, and if you go back to the last auction, the C-band auction in the U.S. where um, operators paid uh, billions of dollars for this spectrum, they're going to be forced to utilize that spectrum where they can achieve quick ROI and, and you know, um, uh, show the profits uh, from their investment. So one of the things that I'd like to see being addressed is that uh, I think the um, regulatory authorities should partner with the uh, operators and perhaps a certain portion of the spectrum should be given to the operators, but in return, the operators commit to expand rural broadband coverage. If you take away $43 billion that Verizon paid to buy its C-band spectrum, and instead told them that spend half of that money to expand in the rural parts of the United States, uh, but I'm not going to charge you for the spectrum, I think that is a conversation that the operators would be open to. But as long as we're charging them billions of dollars for a spectrum, and they are for-profit organizations, they're going to be hard-pressed to want to invest uh, into uh, parts of the world where, where the return is going to be much lower than the urban areas. 
And then the other uh, aspect of it is, uh, as you know, we're discussing in this panel too, the, the coming of new technologies, uh, you know, the virtualized core network, uh, if, you, if you eventually migrate onto a standalone 5G network, you're going to have lower cost back backhaul and backbone uh, networks that make it more feasible to expand the 5G coverage into these rural areas. And so we have to uh, continue to push uh, the adaptation and also the uh, the deployment of uh, true standalone 5G networks along with edge computing and virtualized core in order to make it more feasible to deploy these networks and start covering the five, uh, the, uh, the rural parts of the world. Thank, thank you, Bernard. And yeah, I think that, that idea, I, I've come after spending several days here in the ministerial program here in Barcelona where this issue has been really talked about a lot. And I think in particular that issue of sort of policy commitments in, in terms of in exchange for reduced cost is a growing idea. We've even seen it recently in France. And I think as you highlight coming from the US, this is not an exclusively developing market issue. So, so excellent uh, points to share there. I would like to move on, as I mentioned up front, coverage gap, super important because we want everyone connected. But the much larger um, uh, number of people impacted and digitally excluded right now are those living within broadband network coverage, but who aren't using. So I'd like to direct my next uh, question to Nicholas and to Jami, um, because you know we, we simply know that, that a huge number, 3.3 billion people live within 3G, 4G coverage. And due to a range of barriers, uh, they're somehow not going online. And we know what some of those barriers are, but I would love to get your thoughts. And we'll start with you, Nicholas. Your thoughts on the challenges and how we as an industry, as a society can address them. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, thank you for making the distinction between the coverage gap and the usage gap. Because in many instances, at least until very recently, we, took, we tended to put everything under the same bucket. And it's absolutely very different what the challenges are. We discussed about the network challenges. Here we're talking about why the people are not using uh, the data. Um, so in most cases, when you say that they are not using broadband, they still have a phone. In most cases, they have a phone. Usually it's a 2G phone. So the number one issue that needs to be addressed is how do we migrate the hundreds of millions, if not the billions of people who have a 2G phone into a broadband technology? In some cases, it is still 3G or 4G and maybe eventually 5G. And the biggest gaps that we see in the usage, and this is what we do at KaiOS, is because we see, we see for most users that buying a smartphone is too expensive. For all of us here in this room, we all have a smartphone and we believe it's stable stakes to have one. But in most developing markets, having a smartphone is still expensive. Uh, I think there's a study from the GSMA saying that to be able to afford a smartphone, you need to make $14 a day of income. And we know that billions of people live way, way below that $14 of income threshold. So that's the number one issue. How do we address and reduce the cost of access to digitally capable devices? KaiOS has developed it is a, the, the leader in what is called smart feature phone category. We work with around 50 different brands. We have about 150 million users now. And what, what we do is we provide the key digital services. We have more than 1,000 apps. We provide Facebook and WhatsApp and Google services to people. But the cost and the, and the, the step that they have to, to go from their feature phone into a smart feature phone is minimized. So for, for a few dollars, you can go from a, a basic voice and SMS device to a digital device. This is, this is one of the ways to reduce, to reduce that gap, and it's proving to be very popular across multiple regions. The other big element is, why do I need internet? In many cases, even though it looks obvious for all of us, one of the number one thing we saw in research and talking to our customers is, why do I need it? And why would I pay for data? Why would I pay for something that I don't really see the benefit in my, in my everyday life? So there are two elements here. One is to make sure there is clarity on the cost of data, to make sure you can reduce the cost of data, or you can actually make sure that you can see how much it's going to cost you. And one of the initiatives of one of our partners, uh, Reliance, has been to sell KaiOS devices, which is in, in, in India is called Geophone, with preset data for one year or for two years at a very affordable price. And then this gives visibility, and this uh, en enhances usage. And this is very, very uh, um, uh, critical. And the other element is to make sure that the content is both in the language that local people speak, 
Let's not forget that more than 95% of internet content in the world today is out of 10 languages. There are 7,000 languages in the world. So many people will not find the language that they, that, that they want. So there's a second element which is very critical. So what we, what we do is we work with content providers to make sure that the content that we provide is designed for the usage of people in, in, in the field. We do this at educational programs, we've educated in Nigeria, we do it with, with Just Dig It in, in, in Tanzania for, uh, for agricultural needs. So we can provide uh, elements, very concrete examples where people can improve their lives with content that, that, that they need. Thank you, thank you. You have some key barriers there too expensive, not enough relevant content in local language, some of the identified barriers. Jami, I'd love to pull you into this conversation to get your perspectives on tackling the, this usage gap, and what do you see as the main challenges from your point of view? Thanks, John, I appreciate the question. Uh, it's good to be here today. The first thing maybe that I'd point out is that we often think of coverage as this binary thing, and, and the reality is I think particularly in global agricultural applications that uh, it, it's not really a binary thing. You don't just have coverage or not have coverage. It's really a question of whether or not the coverage that you have uh, supports the use case. Is it reliable? Does it have the bandwidth? Does it have the latency requirements uh, in order to meet the use case? And in global agriculture, uh, you know, it, those, those requirements tend to be fairly significant uh, because our, our devices, uh, the tractors and, and planters and things that are responsible for uh, the agricultural process are effectively uh, just large IoT devices today. They are uh, sensor suites that are doing work but are also creating uh, data as they go in order to help make the agricultural process more effective, more efficient, so that we can continue to feed a growing world population on the same amount of arable land that we have. And, and, I, and I think it points out kind of an interesting uh, opportunity for us to maybe reframe or rethink the problem. And that is that historically we've thought about um, data intensity and as analogous to population density. And I think IoT, and in particular in agriculture, really gives us an opportunity to, to think about that differently because the data intensity that, that I see in our industry uh, isn't aligned with, with population density. It's actually aligned with agricultural density, the density of plants. We're treating each individual plant uh, as its own entity and, and we're uh, you know, tagging metadata to it that allows us to make that plant produce the best that it possibly can. And if you think about that uh, from a, a data magnitude perspective across the globe, uh, as a plant that's creating data, as opposed to a person that's creating data, you know, the, the opportunity space is, is billions and billions and billions uh, of entities that are creating data, as opposed to the human population and the usage, usages that we traditionally think of from a connectivity perspective. So I think it's important for us to think about um, you know, the, the, the coupling between population density and data intensity and really what the benefit of data in these rural locations uh, can bring, not just to the rural location itself, but to society at large, you know, in this case, uh, global, global agricultural and, and food production. Thank you. I think that's a really interesting angle to bring into this and one that we probably don't think about quite as much is this issue of it isn't just about people in terms of the benefits people get. It is these devices and industry sectors um, with the proliferation of IoT devices, which we're seeing all over the floor. But thank you, thank you for that input. And I think we're doing pretty well on time. So I'm going to try to throw out a few more questions before I do want to come into a key question at the end. But Bernard up front had mentioned this issue of, of cost. Um, and Samuel, you and I had a chance to talk a little bit earlier. And um, I would just like, you, you work in Bangladesh. You're in partnership with the government. Um, many of the challenges in terms of the costs that go into deployment do sometimes relate to government policies, whether it be taxation, cost of rights of way, other things. Um, how do you see the opportunity to better work with governments mm -hmm. to address the challenge of coverage? Well, uh, first of all, that I think that uh, um, the outlook of uh, policy making and uh, uh, right out uh, like uh, everybody sees uh, GSM technology as a money making machine, but it is actually not nowadays. Every big companies are losing money. And uh, we, we need to think about that as well. 
because um, one of the speaker told us that uh, we need to think about the heavy taxation and the spectrum costs and everything. We, we need to actually go back to the drawing board and rethink the whole thing because uh, not only GSM is bringing us closer and, and uh, there are so many impacts they're providing nowadays. So we need to actually count those aspects in this regard. Otherwise, now it will be very difficult to move forward. Thank you, thank you. And, and I think another point that was, was just uh, you know, raised a, a few moments ago was this issue of um, content cost, et cetera. But part of it is, of course, the ability to use in digital skills. And coming back again to government, I'd open this to anyone who wants to respond to this question, is whose responsibility is it to get people more versed and more competent in terms of being able to use technology and to build that sort of digital literacy. Um, you know, we at GSMA, we've been partnering with a number of our operators. I know that working with MTN just in the past year in Africa, we've managed to train 18 million individuals and increase their ability to use digital tools. But I wonder if anyone has thoughts on that question of digital literacy and how we go about making it easier for people um, to recognize the value and use digital services. So who would, anyone interested in taking that question? Uh, I'll, I'll give it a go, uh, okay, if I may. Um, <laughs> look, I, I think um, it's easy to, to uh, field a question like this and, and always point to governments and, and policies. But when it comes to uh, this digital divide, my, my response to your question would be, it is all of our responsibilities. It is in the best interest of the uh, economic growth of each country to make sure that all of its citizens are connected and have access to the latest technology. As you mentioned in your opening remarks, the pandemic taught us how important critical uh, broadband connectivity is uh, in, in everyday life. And so you can lower the cost of uh, your health care by being able to offer telemedicine to your uh, citizens who are uh, located in rural areas. You can make uh, higher education more attainable for your citizens who are in the rural areas. You can uh, follow, uh, uh, you know, the industrial IoT uh, applications such as, you know, smart farming and agriculture and make um, companies and farmers that uh, operate in that segment uh, more efficient, more profitable and being able to produce better, uh, better products. So, the society and the country, the nation as a whole benefits when it comes together and expands broadband uh, connectivity to its rural areas and you know, ensuring that it's uh, less privileged uh, citizens or perhaps those who are just located in rural areas have access to these technologies. So, uh, and you know, without being um, uh, sarcastic, if we want to wait for governments to fix this, it will never happen. It has to be a private and public partnership. So I think all of us uh, have to make this commitment that in order for our industry to continue to grow and in order for our societies to continue to flourish, we have to make this commitment of you know, securing this uh, digital uh, divide and, and, and minimizing it as much as possible. Thank you. And Nicholas, I think yes, you're... Yes, sir. I wanted to add one point, and, and I share with you, it's, it's a joint effort from all the different stakeholders. Um, th th there are multiple small, small things also that can be done, things that can be done at the UX. For most people, it's obvious how you use a device. For some others, it's not. The UX is one. I mentioned earlier on the language. Uh, there's a, a, an enormous evolution over the last few years in terms of using voice technologies. So you don't have to go and type and know how to read and write because let's not forget that many people who are not collected also so in some cases have illiteracy issues. So voice is a fantastic enabler to, be, to have access and to make sure that some of the services, some of the basic services can be available. Let's not forget that many people wait and lose a lot of time of their daily work because they have to queue for basic services, whether these are health services or government-related services, just to get a stamp on a piece of paper. All of these things can be done digitally, but this has to be taught and it has to be, to, to, to be managed. But it's a combination of very small steps at local level, at government level, carrier level, uh, manufacturers, content providers. So it's a chain of different elements that will make it happen. 
Thank you, thank you. And Mark, coming back to you, um, I was just wondering if you have, from your perspective in, in the, the United Kingdom, do you see distinctions or differences between the challenges you face in a highly developed market like the UK um, from those faced in other markets? And, and where, do you, you know, where do you differentiate? Yeah, I mean, just bu building on the skills, um, even in an in a advanced economy like the UK, you know, one of the most advanced digital economies around, that the, the pandemic has highlighted for us, I think, so many customers in, in, the, in the UK without the basic digital skills that we all take for granted. Uh, it's highlighted gaps in the education curriculum as well. It's also highlighted um, you know, real gaps in poverty. You know, hundreds of thousands of families across an advanced economy like the UK without access at all uh, to the internet and these are families not just in rural areas i know we, we've been talking about rural but there are some really big issues in in society that uh, that need to be addressed and i agree with the sentiment this is not something we can just look to government to solve we, we are a huge part of the ecosystem in the uk with a, with the biggest broadband and mobile network operator with the most number of customers so we have a responsibility to educate and train and, and we've been putting some really big programs in place for millions of customers to improve their digital skills but also in the last 12 months we've created packages that are more or less a cost uh, for us to give the poorest people in the uk access to the internet at the lowest price possible as well thank you thank you and johnny on a related point obviously agri digital agricultural services are a huge driver um, in many markets um, do you see distinctions in um, in, in the way that affects um, uh, coverage and usage between developing and developed economies? There's no doubt. Yeah, the, the, uh, the efficiency of the agricultural process is strongly connected to the connectivity uh, infrastructure that supports uh, the growers that happen to be operating in that area. And so to the extent that connectivity is absent, the efficiency of the agricultural process suffers substantially. Thank you, thank you. And then I think we are now getting close. Oh, go ahead. Just, go ahead. just, a, just a point. The technology that we are developing today is for tomorrow. So uh, the, 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 the tomorrow guys, like the next generation, the technology that are very uh, new to us, that will not be uh, the case for them. So uh, it, it is a very, uh, that it is uh, imperative that we make it easier for them to make it understand more easily. No, thank you. Thank you for bringing that perspective in from Bangladesh. And, you know, I think one of the things I wanted to go around with everyone for sort of a final question is we're just about out of time. Final reflection in, in one sentence each, uh, based on your experience and your own uh, business, what is the single most impactful action that we could take to increase rural connectivity? Um, let me start with you, Mark. In a sentence. Um... <clears throat> Innovation across multiple technologies and a brilliant partnership with aligned objectives with government. Nicholas. I would say uh, make the step uh, to, digital device, to digital devices more affordable. So make devices significantly more affordable than they are today. And Bernard. So I would say uh, commitment. Uh, you know, just making sure that uh, the the companies in our sector, uh, basically the the private side, and and the governments truly commit to making uh, the connectivity to the uh, rural broadband parts of the world a, a reality, rather than arguing over infrastructure bills and you know the taxation and policies uh, that uh, uh, you know drag on for months and months and sometimes even for administrations, but no results come uh, come out of it. So, just let's commit to addressing this issue for once and for all. Great. And Samuel, one sentence. Um, it's for me, it's fi finance and uh, taxing. Lowering the tax would be definitely help us and uh, financing also. Great, and Jami, final, final sentence. Continued adv advocacy for the customers that don't have a voice and don't have a platform like this in order to, to continue the conversation. Well, thank you all uh, for joining us today. I think that this panel's perspective is hopefully you've given a platform and a voice to those who can't speak, as you say, Jami, on some of these issues. A number of key points raised, I think, um, in terms of both addressing the usage gap 
um, reducing cost, um, making sure we're focusing on shared incentives, um, making sure to factor in gaps within the community, whether it be gender or otherwise. And of course, the bigger area um, usage. Um, key issues obviously are some of these things around the digital skills and making sure the right content and services um, are in place. And I think some important uh, points raised today on thinking also about the innovations and um, IoT solutions that are out there that also need um, uh, to be covered in order for, um, for people in all parts of the world to reap the benefits of mobile broadband. So again, thank you so much. I think that this challenge of, we're, we're very pleased that we've passed 50, or 51% covered and connected to mobile broadband, but that 49%, let's redouble our efforts and try to connect the world. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for having us.